we'll get adjusted as we go, but good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, if you can stand with me, we're going to uh, start by singing some songs together. I want to start by just um, uh, sharing with you a, a set of verses from Philippians 2, uh, 9 through 11 that really kind of embody what our worship this morning is all about. Um, so Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's sing together. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all, hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all to him all majesty ascribe and crown him lord of all continue to sing we fall down we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus the greatness of his mercy and love at the feet of Jesus and we cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 is the lamb let's sing that again we fall down we fall down we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus, the greatness of mercy and love. At the feet of Jesus, and we cry, holy, 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 we cry, we come before you this morning. We come before you humbly because you are worthy to be worshiped. You are the redeemer, our king, our rock, our deliverer. 
You alone are worthy of all of our praise. Lord, please forgive us of our sin and teach us your ways. We want to love, know you more. We want to love you more and walk in your ways every day. The power of your name, Lord Jesus, is mighty. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my deliverer. In him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. You may be seated. Welcome to The Rock. We are so glad you're here to worship with us this beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Ben Honeyford, and we are so glad you're here. them and we got to get on the dance floor a little bit okay i have some video of duncan catlett that you're going to want to see okay and uh so just see me after see he's downstairs teaching so maybe Lindsay was watching online uh, <laughs> but yeah a lot of fun yesterday really enjoyed it want to give you a few quick announcements as uh, we look forward to easter coming but Firstly, we have Living Stones Youth Group, so that'll be meeting this Friday night uh, here at the Rock Church, and that's for ages 10 to 16. So we're, we'll welcome you to bring your kids for that. Angelica's going to be leading that. Um, you can come at 6.30 to 8. So if you have any questions, just see Angelica, but we look forward to having you there. We also added in a work day for this Saturday. I was talking to Mike Pulsinelli, and he said, you know what, I'd love to to pull my sleeves up and, and put some mulch down. I said, you know what? I love that idea. Let's, let's get a work day going. So Dave's helping coordinate that, and uh, you can come this Saturday. We got work gloves for you. It's just going to be outdoor stuff, so I'm going to need Angelica to pick out some flowers. I don't know what flowers we can put in around, but she'll, you'll, she'll give me some, some tips. You, you'll see Dave and let him know what flowers are good. Um, so, yeah, that'll be good. 930 to 1230, just come and and we'll just do some, we'll pick up a little bit of the pine cones and spread some mulch and do some digging a little bit. So uh, look forward to that. Uh, you can sign up. You can see Dave Ritter. You can sign up on the Church Center app. Uh, thirdly, uh, we have, uh, we're going to continue the pray and go effort. As you guys remember, we started that on January 1st. And it was a group, small group of folks, about 10 or less, that we came together and said, you know, we're going to take the next 30 days. So January 1st to the 30th, we had this devotional book it's just once a day you read for five minutes and it just encourages you to be praying for the church be praying for yourself to be more outward focused to our community to our sphere of influence you know wherever you work and live and 
and go to school. God has placed you there. We know God's word that he says that he has you in, the, in exactly where he wants you to be, the times and seasons he's ordained. So we want to continue that effort. If you were a part of that group, you can certainly rejoin it. But if you haven't been part of it, we can invite you to do so by, you know, go to the church center app. And it's just a book. There's one, a couple copies on the table. It's just $10. Take the book home with you and just go through the book on a 30-day devotional. It's not a big ask. It's not a lot of meetings and, and a lot of uh, effort to go into it. But just really praying and seeking the Lord and bringing about the, the prayer and great commission revolution to the church. Continue. It's always the, the, the tendency of a church to kind of focus in rather than focusing out. So we want to keep doing that. If April 1st doesn't work, we're going to do it again. And this is, the, you know, again, part of the year of the local missionary. Okay, lastly, I want to encourage you for Easter. This is our opportunity for outreach to reach folks that come. Remember we call them? You guys remember what I called them? The c &E Christians. Christmas and Easter. That's it. They're, they're checking their box. We want them to check their box here, hear the gospel, and get saved. That's a wonderful thing. So encourage you to take 10 cards, invite 10. That's the idea. In your, in your pew there, you'll see there should be some, some copies of those invite cards. Invite you to just grab a stack and say, you know what, Lord, show me who are the 10 people you want me to invite. That may sound a little overwhelming to you. Just start, you know, start with a few and see what happens. You'd be surprised. You go to, you know, go to the grocery store, you go to your workplace or school, you're interacting with people all the time and it just takes a minute to say, hey, would you come to Easter? And you'll be uh, surprised. Many people, so we're in that post-Christian culture, but people have no idea what church means or is. They don't know what goes on in here and they're somewhat more open to it than in previous generations because they have no experience with the church at all. So this is our opportunity to really continue advancing the gospel. And that's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. So Easter Sunday, 10 o'clock, Good Friday on that Friday prior at 7. So that'll be good too, that Good Friday to really celebrate the Lord's death. This is the day that he, he went to, to die on the cross. And so that's an important time as we remember what he did. And then on the third day, he rose again. That's why we worship on Sunday, because it's the celebration of the resurrection every Sunday we meet to worship. So that's a, a very, very good thing. If giving is part of your worship, encourage you certainly in the pews, you have the envelopes, you can certainly text the word, uh, you can text any dollar amount to 84321 and you follow the prompts that way as well. So with that being said, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord and get some prayer requests from you and I uh, encourage you to just lift your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Again, as we always say, make it short, make it a request or a praise and try to avoid any uh, political speech or commentary or devotionals, <laughs> which is totally fine. So yeah, so just lift your hand and, and Pete will be, will be walking by there, so. There we go. There's Randy. And you can text in too, I ha I'll have the app open. So you can text into text in church, and I'll be looking at that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to have a prayer for Rich Kesslin. Uh, I grew up with Richard and uh, just recently connected with him after 40 years. We grew up as uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, so he's uh, disfellowship now, and he's kind of on the bubble, not sure. Where he is with God, so I'd, I'd really like to pray for him. That's great. Thank you, Randy. Good morning. I just hey, have a praise report. My brother that was um, struggling with drugs and alcohol was really bad, homeless and all. He has been clean for four months. Mm. Um, praise God. Yeah. He's been going to church. Calls me every week. Um, he's got his own bank account. He's really doing well. Good. And I just thank God for that. What was his name again? Larry. Just okay. Thanks. <coughs> Good. Excellent. Hi. Um, my old neighbor Bob. Not 
Well, I mean, he's my previous neighbor, uh, although he is like 94, but <laughs> he, just, he just lost his wife. Mm. He was in the hospital. He's now gone to assisted living this week up in Pennsylvania, but I, I've been sharing some time with him the last few days. And um, he, he's a devout Catholic, but we, I shared my testimony with him, and I gave him a New Testament because I explained that um, I was raised Catholic too, and I never really realized what Jesus did for us, and that's like the mm. main important thing because I know he's afraid of dying. Mm. Um, so I just pray that God will be with him and make sure that he's going to heaven. Thanks, Doris. Appreciate that. Andrea. Andrea's back. Hi. Um, just some prayers for my friend April and uh, Amanda. They lost their sister to domestic violence. Um, and she leaves behind two sons. So just, you know, cover them with prayers. And, you know, um, the service was actually really beautiful. They were, they were drawing to Christ and not away from Christ. Because, you know, in tragedy... Either you can cling to God or you can, you know, push away. Yeah. But the service, they were just praising God, and it was awesome. absolutely beautiful. But uh -huh. just continue that they continue to do that. Got it. April and Amanda's sister. Got it. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah. Just want to um, ask prayers for uh, Courtney and us as we're getting closer to the due date. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> April 4th, is it? April 4th is the due date. Ah. <laughs> Open sooner. <laughs> All right. That's exciting. Alyssa's got one as well. So my cousin's actually best friends with April. And um, I continue prayers for her because she has said that I went to the view and she was like, I just want to glorify God in this. The enemy mm. has no, no place in this. So mm. it's just, just to go off of Andrea. Um, and wow. then... <clears throat> I am going to come under, uh, well, I already am coming under attack um, from the closest people to me because I'm choosing the Lord's way. And mm -hmm. it's scary, um, mm -hmm. but in obedience to him, I know I'm doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So just strength for that. And mm -hmm. um, to the world, I, I may look like a fool, but that's what we're called to do. And just to keep my eyes on him, my audience yeah. of one, and not what anyone else says. Amen. So. Very good, Alyssa. Proud of you. Good. All right, guys. All right. I'd like to oh, pray Pete. for our children, uh, yeah. both young and also the older children. I have all adult children, that they may come to conviction in Christ. Hmm. to wake the little guy up this morning sorry he that's all right <laughs> just in time louisa um a deep prayer for him because um this is the third time i guess and maybe a year and a half grayson he's just standing up and all of a sudden he just blacks out oh no and they can't find anything and i rebuke that and i just i have a covenant with the lord for me and my children and my children's children hmm. grayson right yeah yeah Thanks, Louisa. Okay. Let's pray as we go to the Lord. And then we're going to sing Speak, O Lord, aren't we? Yeah. Who knows the song Speak, O Lord? Some. You're going to love it. It's a great song. Right before the sermon, love it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that we can come to you with our hearts cry as your dear children that you suffered and died for, the ones that you have given life and life eternal. We are so grateful for the privilege that it is to come to our Father who loves us with an everlasting love, the same love that existed forever and continues to exist between the Father and the Son is now given to us because we're in Christ. So, Lord, as we lift our hearts to you, we pray for Rich, who's been disfellowshipped from the Jehovah's Witnesses, that you would grant to him salvation. 
in this false cultic practice of Jehovah's Witnesses, there are many that are deceived. And we pray that you would release him from the chains of that deception, that you'd remove the scales from his eyes, that he would hear your voice and he would come to you. Jesus, draw him, we pray, and powerfully save him and use Randy for that end. Lord, we thank you so much for Juanita's brother, Larry, who's been clean for four months and his life is moving forward. You're taking away these addictions and giving him your peace. God, encourage him with your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for Doris and sharing about Bob, a neighbor who's lost his wife and now in assisted living and a devout, a devout Catholic, that he would come to understand who Jesus is and the power of the gospel. Lord, save Bob. Help him to know that you're real and you love him. You have a wonderful plan for his life. We thank you for Andrea and grieve to hear of the loss of April and Amanda's sister. We pray that you would comfort the family and, yes, be glorified even in the midst of darkness and loss. We thank you for Courtney and pray for that little one to come forth and that you would grant your protection over that child and over Courtney, that you would bring health, strength, and that you would use this child for your kingdom and glory. Bring this child into the world with joy. And for Alyssa, as she continues to follow the Lord and faces challenges and opposition around her, that you would strengthen her, strengthen her mind and her heart to follow after you and to put aside all of the lies and deception that might come against her. Thank you for Pete and pray his children that they would come to salvation, that they would know and love the Savior. And Luisa's grandson, Grayson, Lord, this, ch this dear child facing these blackouts, we pray that you would give wisdom to doctors and bring healing to his body, that you would help him in this time. Even this morning, Holy Spirit, would you come upon him? We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand? Yes. Yes, let's do that. I'm going, to, I'm going to read from uh, the passage that Pastor will be preaching from, Ephesians 1, verse 12 through 20. If you have your Bible, you can open up to that, Philippians 1, starting verse 12. If you have a, uh, a Bible in front of you in the pew, the, the hardback black one, um, it's page 921. So if you want to find that, you can read along with us. I want to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has be become known throughout the whole Imperial Guard and that all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by the imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only what is every, in every way, whether to pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that throughout your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be all ashamed, but that with full coverage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death.
speak O Lord as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word take your truth planted deep in us shape and fashion us in your likeness that the light of christ might be seen today and our acts of love and our deeds of faith speak O lord and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Test our thoughts our attitudes in the radiance of your purity. Cause our faith to rise, cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority. Words of power that can never fail. Let the truth prevail over Unchanged from the dawn of time that we let go down through eternity, and by grace will stand on your promises, and by faith will walk as you walk with us. Speak, O oh Lord your church is built and the earth is built with your glory you may be seated ah love that awesome okay Great. You guys have your Bibles. We are in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 20. And as I always say, you are welcome to keep the Bibles. If you don't own one, they're yours to take. So it's important that you, you have the scripture. You can follow along with us. You can take notes. Uh, you can go to notes.therocksj.org. I always put questions there so that you can take the sermon and bring it throughout the week and engage more with the text. So let's pray together as we prepare our hearts. Can't think of a better song than that one for, for us this morning. Father, we settle our hearts before you, our great king, our great prophet, our great priest. Lord, you are are everything. In you we live and move and have our being. You are the sustainer. You are the keeper of our lives. And you hold all things together. You are the glorious Christ. You are the one that we worship. You are the one that we bow the knee to. The king over all. The ruler of the universe. Oh Lord. Speak to our hearts. 
meet with us today, wherever we are in our struggle, in our trial, in our difficulty. You know, you understand, and you care for us. So this day, we need you. Holy Spirit, we need you to strengthen us so that we can walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, that we can bear fruit in keeping with repentance, that we would, you're, you would be pleased with us and that we know you are because we are in Christ and we bring nothing but our entire lives. We lay before you and say, Lord, you're worthy. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. We commit this time to you and we pray your blessing that you would speak to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. In the past week or so, you've probably noticed the warmer weather. The sun is shining. You've detected some flowers sprouting from the ground. It's the warm glow of those yellow daffodils. Listen, do you hear the birds singing? Could it be, is spring finally upon us? Are the dreary days of the long, cold winter a soon to be memory? Can we finally put away the salt melt and the snow plows and the heavy jackets? We've sprung forward. We've gained another hour of sunlight. Hallelujah. And now with the sweet influence of the sun, we can put aside sorrow and put on joy. Spring is coming. Let's start thinking about the garden, preparing the soil, laying out where we want the vegetables. Let's order the mulch. Let's spread it around the landscape. Let's get outside, get some fresh air. Let's take a walk around the neighborhood. For a lot of us, these thoughts and ideas bring great joy to our soul. But there's a greater joy, a greater happiness to the heart. It's one that all year round shines into our soul. Always, at all times, he lays the seeds of joy, watering them with the sweetness of his word growing them by his spirit. And it's none other than Christ himself, the son of God. And so when he pours his light into our soul, there's no other response but that of joy. A deep, abiding happiness, an ever-satisfying river of life. It's none other than our great high priest, prophet and king, in his priestly duties, he ensures that we grow stronger in the faith. In his duty as prophet, he ensures that we grow stronger in his word. And in his kingly duties, he ensures total reign over our hearts. How is Jesus our greatest joy? Because he's the only one that can maintain a deep, abiding peace in our thoughts, in our emotions, and in our hearts. He keeps his perfect rule over us. It's his joy in us that never gets tired or grows weary. It's his joy in us that always maintains a hope for eternal salvation. It's his joy in us that is stronger and sweeter than anything this world has to offer. And the joy and happiness we have in Christ is sustained regardless of our circumstances. In, it's kept in the midst of trial and tribulation. It's the constant flow of water from the well that never grows dry. It never ceases, even unto our very last breath, as we look forward to that final moment when we'll be in the presence of the Lord forever. It's the oil of gladness from the Holy Spirit granting us joy in all circumstances, for all of life, for all the glory of God. Is there anything else this world can offer that comes close? Everything the world gives is temporary. The passing joy of a new purchase, a new car, a new house, a new phone, the fleeting joy of a personal pleasure, a relationship, 
a drink, a drug. The Lord is going to give us the greatest joy of sitting down to eat with him, to enjoy the choicest of all delicious delights. And at no point are we going to recoil over the bitter herbs or cough at the overcooked steak or wince at the mushy vegetables. All we have to look forward to is the perfect joy of Christ in us and the even better joy of being with him for all eternity. That's where I'm trying to go this morning. It's the big idea if you're taking note. The greatest joy is exalting all of Christ in all of life. And I have three points for you. Number one, there's great joy in suffering for Christ, for the cause of Christ. Number two, there's great joy in true gospel proclamation. And number three, there's great joy in a life that's lived for the glory of Christ. Let's look at that first point. There is great joy in suffering for Christ, for the cause of Christ. Verses 12 to 14, Philippians chapter 1. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, brethren, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having been confident become confident in the Lord, by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Brothers and sisters, I have a question for you. Are you living to advance your own personal agenda, your own achievements, your own status, your own influence, or are you living to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ? Oh, pastor, that wasn't nice. Why would you make such a claim? Well, as I consider my own heart, which I don't think is too different from yours, I know that my natural tendency is to advance my own interests. It's to make my life better, more pleasurable, more convenient. Isn't that the American dream? And here's what the Apostle Paul is imprisoned in Rome. For some reason, he's able to see that this cause for which he was in chains had a purpose. He didn't complain to God by saying, Oh Lord, why would you put me in this dreary, dungy prison? What is the purpose for this season of my life? I just can't see it. I just can't understand it. For many of you, you're asking that very same question. Lord, it's my health. It's my living circumstances. It's my finances. It's my personal relationships. You know, I just can't see how the gospel is making progress as a result of the suffering in my life. Why is it so hard to see what happens to us in our hardships and difficulties as part of God's plan? Why? because we have been sold the prosperity gospel in America. It's ever so subtle. It peeks in to the hearts of believers. But the Apostle Paul didn't want that to happen in the church of Philippi. His reminder to them is one of encouragement. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. The gospel and the glory of God are far a greater cause than my personal comfort. For me, I remember back to November of 2021. It was an exciting time for me because I'd finally made the transition from bivocational ministry to full time. And I thought, okay, all my problems are going to go away. All the stress of a full time job and work and, and starting a new church and serving the family. And then, immediately thereafter, I got COVID, double lung pneumonia, hospital stay five days, out of the pulpit for eight weeks. But guess what? The gospel continued to be advanced. Another pastor, John Laskin from Cornerstone, joyfully stepped in to preach, came in all eight weeks, jumped in, never put the pressure on me to say, you ready yet? Are you ready to come back? 
He's like, I'll just take it from here. The advancement of gospel ministry does not rest on one man. The Lord knew I'd be out for that time. And he had a purpose for it. Clearly to humble me that God is sovereign over all. And the saints at the rock continue to be strengthened by the word of God. How is that possible? Because when God's word goes out by the power of the Holy Spirit, guess what? It never returns void. Remember during this time, Paul was able not to, uh, to write not only to the church in Philippi, but also to the churches in Ephesus and Colossae. I want you to hear me. God is using every season of your life, or of our lives, for the advancement of the gospel, even though, even when it doesn't feel like it. Remember, American Christians have this tendency to hype up experiences. Or, if not experiences, then checking the boxes. Oh, I witnessed to five people last week. How many did you witness to? I led two people to the Lord last month. How many did you lead to the Lord? And on and on the list goes. Oh, I, I pray every day for two hours. I read my Bible. I study the Greek and on and on. But the Lord is saying, it's my power, not your own. That's changing lives. And while spiritual disciplines are a wonderful thing, they aren't the tools for spiritual pride or for condemnation when you say in your heart, oh Lord, I can't believe it. That guy prays two hours a day. He shared the gospel with five people. He led two people to the Lord. I'll never be able to do that. And the condemnation is built and built. That guy, whoever's doing that, needs to be humbled. Here's what Paul understood that his imprisonment was not in vain. Why? Because people everywhere were hearing about it. Notice in the text, did you hear what happened to Paul? No, what, what happened to him? He's in jail for preaching the gospel. Really? Is the gospel worth going to jail for? Yes, dear brothers and sisters, it is. And while we're not yet in that place in our nation, that day could come. And I'll just say, perhaps sooner than later than we think. Are we ready to truly suffer for the name of Jesus Christ and, and count it a joy in the process? And when people start getting arrested for sharing the gospel, it will make a huge impact for the advancement of the gospel. Why? Because people will see that this must be true. That if someone's willing to go to jail and to suffer, it must be a cause worth fighting for. I want to hear about the mighty Jesus, not the he gets us Jesus. Right now we have churches that are still interested, more interested in filling buildings than making disciples. But when the cost of following Jesus gets higher and higher, we will see the purifying effect that that has on his bride, the church. Our devotion and passion for Jesus will grow stronger and stronger. Paul mentions here the imperial guard. Who are they? Well, these were the men that were entrusted to protect the Roman emperor. They were like our secret service today who protects the president. They knew as well as everyone else, here is a man in jail for Christ. Do you see what he said in the text? He is in jail for Christ. Do you consider your present suffering in whatever form it is to be for Christ? Do you count it a joy to endure for the sake of the name? Are you looking to the gospel of Jesus Christ for the reminder that Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe? Or are you like me? It gets a little frustrated when things don't go your way. You live a life that's always worried about bad news that could come. What could happen to my child? What could happen to my career? What could happen to my home? Or are you safely trusting in the Lord Jesus? I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, it's going to get better from here on out. 
It can only get better. We may suffer in in these bodies, in this world, but there is something better that awaits us. There's something perfect and beautiful that's coming. So let's be about advancing God's gospel and not our own. Let's be about encouraging lost people that hope is possible in the person and work of Christ. Paul wasn't so self-centered to think, that just because he's in prison, people were not then going to be discipled. No, ministry continued as he focused his time in prayer. Sometimes we need that. We need that season of quiet, that season of stillness, that season of waiting for the Lord. And as we suffer well, guess what impact that has on other people around us? They see our lives. And it encourages them all the more. Oh, if Billy can endure through hardship and difficulty, surely I can too. That was the effect that Paul's imprisonment had on believers. What what does it say in verse 14? That most of the believers were seeing Paul and the result is what? Trusting in the Lord even more. Their confidence in the Lord was growing. Is your confidence in the Lord growing as you continue to witness his faithfulness in your life and not your own faithfulness? As you continue to experience the goodness of God to to see you through the hardest of times, does that have an effect on your spiritual life? Do you have joy in Christ? Do you have more courage to speak the word without fear? When an opportunity arises to share the gospel with a coworker, a friend, or neighbor, do you take that opportunity or does fear take over? Let me just say this. It's perfectly natural for fear to come over us. What to say, how to say it. That's why we're continuing this group of pray and go, because we know that we need each other to encourage one another. We're talking about the gospel as the power of God unto salvation. Do you think there's going to be opposition in our own hearts and those around us and in the world? Absolutely. That's why he's given us the church to encourage, to build one another up, to spur one another on. Because this boldness that we're talking about, it's not something that you reach down in to find in your heart. It's not like we get into this big room and have a big pep rally for Jesus. It's not like we... Get our emotions worked up and keep proclaiming. All right, guys, repeat after me. Ready? Okay. I will proclaim the gospel with boldness and keep saying it over and over again until finally we're all worked up and we all go running outside to start shouting the name of Jesus. We don't know why, but it's just an emotional thing. No, we wait upon the Holy Spirit. We trust that the Lord will open doors for his glorious gospel to go forth in the very lives of the people that God has put in our path. This is the, what God has ordained, the times and the seasons for your life. Some of us want to go far away to another country to, to do missions and get the gospel out. And yet the Lord is saying, I want you to go forward where you are right now today with the gospel. We trust the Lord for that. This is the confidence that we have in the Lord, that he who began a good work in us, we said this last week, is faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, until the day that Jesus comes back. There is great joy to suffer for the cause of Christ because we know it's accomplishing something. Just like when Jesus suffered on the cross, he knew the glorious outcome. And what, it was, and what was that outcome? What did it mean when Jesus said, it is finished? That his work was complete to save a people for his possession. That Jesus would die, but not stay in the grave. No, he would rise from the grave by the power of God, by the Father saying to the Son, I approve and receive the work that was done on behalf of God's people. It's finished. It's done. And Jesus rose. He sent the helper and he went to the right hand of the Father. And we have the Holy Spirit of God in us to lead us, to encourage us, to equip us for every good work that he's called us to do. We have nothing to fear because Jesus is with us 
even until the end of the age. So be of good courage. Your suffering is never wasted with God. Know that it's being used for the advancement of the gospel. How else do we exalt all of Christ for all of life? Well, we just mentioned suffering. How about the second point? Number two, there is great joy in gospel proclamation. True gospel proclamation. Verses 15 to 18. Let's read again. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm here, put here, for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Not very nice. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. So clearly what we're seeing here is that there seems to be some competition in ministry during Paul's day. Imagine the best news ever being proclaimed to the entire world, entire people groups, entire regions. It was this spirit of the bold new frontier. Much like in our nation when people came to settle and it was the wild west and going out to explore. Something where no one else had been. The driving force to go. And now, 2,000 years later, the competition continues in the church. But this time, it's not for new converts. It's for bigger buildings, larger crowds, and great comfort in the material. I would be lying if I said that thoughts don't come into my mind on some Sundays that say, well, what if no one comes to church and it's just me? Well, that's silly, Pastor. Why would you think something so irrational? I might ask you the same question. Why be afraid if God is with us? Why did Jesus have to say so many times, do not fear? Because it's our nature to fear and to pursue self-preservation. Certainly fear can be a good thing. Otherwise, especially the men, wouldn't live very long lives. But when our identity is in how much stuff, how big the building, how many in the crowd, we've missed the whole point of gospel ministry. Some of the ministers in Paul's day were actually excited that he went to prison. Because that would mean, oh, the big guy? He's in prison? We can now, we can take credit for the ministry that he would have had to do? And, and that's, that's for us now? It'd be like a, a big retail giant like Walmart or Target went under, leaving, leaving a whole opportunity for another company to grab up the market share. But gospel ministry is not market share, and it's not competition. Churches should partner with other like-minded churches, I will caveat that, who are passionate about advancing the gospel. Not just any gospel, the true gospel. And this is why I would encourage you to have rest in sound biblical theology, what some call reform theology, semper reformanda, always reforming, always coming back to scripture. And confessions like the 1689 London Baptist Confession or the Westminster Confession, which have spanned hundreds of years and have been tested by men of great theological mind. And still to this day, churches affirm these confessions. They're not trying to recreate their statement of faith, but rather pick up from what those faithful churches that went before them. And there is great safety in that. But Paul would humbly say, you know what? I don't care what the motive of the minister is. As long as they're faithful to proclaim the true gospel. Why would he say that? Why would he be so bold? It even seems a bit foolish. You know, my first glance at this text was, you know what, I think motive does matter, Paul. Why would you say that? But what did Jesus say about the matter? Those that are not against me are for me. And what was the context of what Jesus was talking there? It was the disciples. They're complaining to him. They're saying, look at those people casting out demons in your name, and you don't even know anything about it. Jesus didn't discourage it. In fact, he promoted it. And he went far, so far as to say, anyone that gives a cup of cold water in my name shall not re- re- lose their reward. In fact, some of you 
might have become Christians under some strange circumstances. You could have been from a church or some event when there was some deliverance minister or prosperity gospel being promoted. And even in the midst of that false doctrine, God got a hold of your heart with his true gospel. That's the good news that are of our God. That he uses the weak things of the world, even the error in our ways, as hard as it is to say that. Because the reality is that all churches have some error in them. There's no such thing as a perfect church with perfect ministers who proclaim a perfect gospel. If you go through my sermons over the last few years, you might find some errors in them. Don't do that, though. (laughs) Some of you are, like, really excited about that. Randy's like, you just gave me some homework. (laughs) Oh, man. I don't think that Paul loses sleep over maintaining perfect doctrinal purity with all the churches in the known world. Think about this guy. If I was the Apostle Paul, I would be immensely worried. Oh man, the church in Corinth, they're a mess. What are we going to do with them? The church over in Philippi, we, I love them, but there's concerns. The church over here, the church over there, he's got concerns with all of them. But he doesn't seem to lose sleep over it. And this happens in the church. The that people come into leadership positions with wrong motives. They think that if they could build a big church and establish a big following, they'll truly be successful. But even still, Paul is encouraged that Christ is proclaimed, even with the wrong motive. It doesn't matter, even Pentecostal, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, the list goes on. As long as Christ is proclaimed, then we should rejoice. We shouldn't be on the witch hunt looking to tear down every single minister of the gospel that doesn't perfectly align with our values and doctrine. I know that's maybe hard for you to hear, but at the same time, we also need to be wise and listening. It's it's that tension between wanting the gospel to go forward, partnering with other like-minded churches, but also guarding against false doctrine and all those things. We have to be wise about that. We have to be discerning and innocent about that. Again, why does Paul love the church in Philippi so much? Because they're preaching Christ out of love. Knowing that Paul was appointed to provide a reasoned argument for the gospel. The church in Philippi is with Paul. They're cheering him on. They're supporting him in every way that they could. And as I said last week, that's a wonderful thing to have. A partnership in the gospel with others. It's a wonderful thing to walk together in unity and agreement. It's a wonderful thing to cheerfully and joyfully lift one another up in prayer. But sadly, there are many who preach Christ for their own personal gain. They do so with motives that are not pure, and for some reason, it becomes a competition. Those in Paul's day thought, now's my opportunity to outdo Paul. He's locked away. He can't do anything. They were actually thinking in their hearts, oh, poor Paul, stuck in prison. Now we're going to get more converts than him. Now we're going to build up our spiritual resume. He must be really stressed about that. He must be really concerned. No, no, guys, you're missing it. The kingdom of God is at hand, and it's being advanced. Every new believer that comes in, and every believer that's growing in the knowledge of God. And we certainly have folks here that come to the rock for a season, and then they move on. That's okay. Guess what? We're not holding anyone here under obligation. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. We want everyone to come to church with joy, and certainly joy in serving the church you don't want to be here, that's okay. But it's important that we're all part of Bible-believing, Christ-centered churches. And then that's when we can rejoice, when churches even in our area or in the world grow by the grace of God. It's certainly important for me to stay connected, to stay connected with other pastors in the area. We're in this together, and it's a beautiful thing when we can support one another in various ways. Paul says it twice here. I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. Here's the deal. If you know other pastors 
at other churches and have friends at other churches, here's what I want you to do. Encourage them to keep doing it, to keep proclaiming the gospel. Yes, there will always be some who do so with wrong motives, but as long as that true gospel is going forward and advancing, there is great joy. We should never be envious of other churches or other believers. Oh, I wish our church did that. Boy, they got a whole gym and a, they have an exercise room for the Lord. I mean, look at that. They got a whole restaurant. They got a daycare. What's the deal with our church? Now let's build one another up. Encourage one another as the day draws near. The truth is that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The lost need the gospel, and we need it every day to be encouraged. How many of you beat yourselves up because you haven't performed well enough for the Lord? You look to the gospel. You look to Christ, and you see what he did for you, and then your attitude changes because it's him and you that's the hope of glory, not your own religious works. Let's rejoice together in gospel proclamation that's going out through the whole world. You know, we don't see, we, we have our, I'll, I'll just be the first to admit it, I got my rock church lenses on. I'm like, all right, what do we got to do? I'm not thinking about the other churches, I'm not thinking about the world, but God has ordained that throughout the whole world, these bodies of believers who are proclaiming the gospel. Yes, there's error, and yes, there's false doctrine, and we have to guard against that, but God is working to advance his church. Did you know his church hasn't died, and it's been around a long time you know why because the holy spirit has continued to advance and save people and grow people by the grace of god that's a wonderful thing so first if you're taking note there's great joy to suffer for christ for the cause of christ there's great joy in true gospel proclamation and the last thing is there's great joy in a life lived for the glory of christ i want to read verses 19 to 20 For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed. But with that, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. If there's one thing about the Christian life, it's this. Not one person has become a Christian by the grace of God ever thought that their life would be wasted as a result. No, quite the opposite. In fact, life that comes into the light of Christ is a life illuminated by joy, meaning, and purpose. We once walked in darkness, and now we've seen his marvelous light. Everything is different. There is joy, there is peace, and as Paul puts it, there is confidence. How so? Do you see what he he says here in verse 19? I know. What do you know, Paul? Why are you so confident? You think you're something really special, don't you? No, nothing special about me, says Paul. But I know that there's power. And I'm going to give you, there's two ways that I see the power. Well, What is it, Paul? Tell us. It's the prayers of the people and the help of the Holy Spirit. Can you think of two more powerful things? Yes, of course, God's word and God's spirit. But as we consider how God works through his ordinary means of grace, we're ordinary people, aren't we? Extraordinary God, you agree? He's working through the means. He's working through the ends. Your prayers are part of God's means to accomplish his ends. That's right. God is moving based on your prayers. That you pray, even though he ordained them. God, it's, it's this mystery. God doesn't just operate independently, but loves to operate through the prayers and the cries of his people. God loves to hear his children crying out for him, especially when it's not just for our own needs, but for the needs of our brothers and sisters in the faith. It's almost like God saying, I think they're starting to understand that their love for one another is growing into the very same love that the Father and the Son have. 
I think we can confidently say that without the prayers of God's people, the church remains somewhat powerless. Yes, God will do what he's planned before the foundations of the world, but it's rather sad when God's people forfeit the privilege to come before their great God and Savior. It's when we retreat to this idea of fatalism, forsaking the joys of being in Christ, that it's all just going to happen the way that God has planned, and so why pray? Why do anything? No, 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 no. Let that not be said of us. Paul says here that he had no shame or regrets. He wasn't sitting in jail thinking, you know what, I'm not sure if this Christian life was really worth it. Was it worth it going hungry, naked, shipwrecked, beaten? No, quite the opposite for Paul. The more that he suffered, the more joy seemed to overflow his heart. Oh, no, not me. That that wouldn't happen to me. I I just hate it when I suffer. My prayer is not, Lord, help me through this trial. It's, Lord, you better take me out of this trial. I've had about enough of this. That's not how Jesus prayed his high priestly prayer. You know that one? John 17, take note of that. As Paul thought about all the prayers that were being offered to the Lord on his behalf, he was greatly encouraged. And we should be too, as we desire to lift one another up, knowing that God hears and answers as we pray according to his will. When we come together in church, we we should be saying, man, I've been praying for you. I know you're going through it. I'm praying for you. Tell me how that works out. I want to keep praying for you. Pray and pray and pray. Paul talked about deliverance. He had confidence that God was going to work this out. He's not talking about being delivered from a demon. Come on. He's talking about his salvation. It's a present tense thing if you look up the original language. Present tense deliverance. He enjoys all the benefits of being in Christ. And that's true for us as well. We talked about it last week, but it bears repeating. You have been delivered. You are being delivered and you will be delivered. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Even when it gets hard. Even when you feel distant from God. Even when you're deceived by your own sin. God remains faithful to complete the work that he started in you. Paul knew the power of prayer and the help of the Holy Spirit. Do you know that same power? Have you ever sensed the prayers of the saints? I remember when Wendy's husband went home to be with the Lord. I'll never forget what she said. She said, you know what? I know that people are praying for me because it's sustaining me. That was a powerful testimony to the people of God and how she was able to endure and continues to endure. And what does that deliverance, that present salvation of all true Christians produce? It's what Paul calls an eager expectation and hope. It's this persistency in his spirit that whatever happens, he's hopeful. How? How, Paul? How could you be hopeful in such dire straits? It's because he knew at the end of, the, of it all, he's going to heaven. He's going to be with the Lord forever. And that didn't rest upon the Apostle Paul's performance. Far from it. It was this strong expectation of good. Yes. But it was also a joyful expectation that God was at work. It rem- I'm reminded of a ministry in Haiti called Cross to Light. Right now, the Haitian people are being taken over by five to 7,000 escaped prisoners. They're basically destroying the country, taking it over. And here's this ministry with a Bible training center. I couldn't believe it. I read their last update. They said this. We have five pastors teaching through the Bible, and they haven't missed a class yet. Excuse me, what was that? They said that 95% of all ministry and relief organizations have left the country. And here they are teaching the Bible. Gunfire. I I would call that an eager expectation of hope. I think in their spirit they're saying whether in life or death, very real sense, I have full confidence that Christ will always be exalted in my body. Let's make that our cry. As the days get darker, with the threat of violence and political instability and economic turmoil, I'm reading the news too. I got my guys I listen to. I know it. 
May Christ always be honored in our mortal bodies, whether by life or by death. And that's certainly only by the grace of God to have that kind of perspective, to be able to endure as Cross to Light Ministry is right now in the trenches of complete chaos. I mean, they described the ministry team that just got on the last flight back to the States, and they're basically shooting up the whole airport. They get the last team out of there. What a wild scene. Let me ask you this. Is there a guarantee for safety in our lives? There really isn't. In fact, contrary to popular opinion, most of us have enjoyed a pretty peaceful existence. Maybe not in our hearts, but never really a threat to our lives or our nation. But know this, you'll never regret living for the glory of Christ. You'll never regret having to suffer for the name. You'll never regret proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to all who would hear. There are some, these are some of just the greatest joys in exalting all of Christ for all of life. So as we close this morning, it's time to consider where we're putting our confidence and joy. Are we confident that the suffering in our lives will end and then only then will we have joy? Is it possible? Or is it possible for us to have joy in our suffering right now today? We certainly aren't facing jail or a threat to our lives, so it really isn't that bad. What certainly could be in your heart and mind, living in a prison there, nothing worse than that kind of prison, unable to grasp the sweetness of the Savior, only able to see everything through the lens of self. Oh, self, would you leave me alone? I just want Jesus. Next time your soul brings an accusation, speak to your soul. Just like King David did in Psalm 42, verse 5. He said, hey, soul, why are you so cast down? Why are you in turmoil in me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Tell that soul something. Hmm. That's what we have, a salvation so great. But Jesus was willing to suffer and die for his own people. Jesus gave up his life for us. Let that be your joy. The gospel. Let the gospel of Jesus Christ shine light into your soul. Yeah, it's great that spring is coming, that Easter is coming, but it's even greater to celebrate the joy of Christ. Joy in the midst of suffering, joy in gospel proclamation, joy in living for the glory of God in Christ. We're going to take a minute now, our one minute moment, and as we prepare to do that, I want you to be thinking about your joy. Think about where you've been placing your hope. Is your eager expectation that your circumstances will improve? Or is your eager expectation that one day you'll be delivered from this body of death and forever be with the Lord? Let's take one moment now in quiet. After that minute, Michael's going to come up and I'll close in prayer. Let's consider our joy and meet with the Lord together in a quiet moment. Lord Jesus, you are our hope and joy. It was a joy for you to go to the cross and to suffer the most gruesome of death, knowing what that would accomplish for us, your people. So in light of our suffering, in light of the pain, in light of the trial, in light of 
our circumstances, would you give us joy? Joy that doesn't come from within or found in the recesses of our soul, but a joy that comes from Christ. A joy to trust in the Savior. A joy to taste and see that the Lord is good. A joy to drink from his word and to pour forth our hearts before our God. A joy to gather together to experience the common grace of God and the ordinary means of grace. Lord, we look to you, our helper, from whence comes the Lord. We look to you, our maker, our, our king, our savior, and know that you give strength to the weary, hope for the hurting. You use you turn our ashes into beauty. Take that spirit of heaviness and fill our hearts with joy. That's our cry this morning, that we would be people of joy. People that know where our joy comes from and able to endure whatever suffering, whatever pain, rejoicing in the true gospel going forward and living for the glory of your name. So we give you thanks that you have called us and done a mighty work to save and doing a mighty work to continue to save us, changing us more and more into the image of Christ. We say thank you. We worship you. We honor you with our bodies, whether in life or in death. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease my comforter my all in all here in the love of christ i stand alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless pain this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross that Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by dark then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine Bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny, 
No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. I find my strength, I find my hope, I find my help in Christ alone. When fears assail, when darkness falls, I find my peace in Christ alone. I give my life, I give my all, I sing my soul to Christ alone. The King of kings, the Lord I love, all heaven sings to Christ alone, to Christ alone. turns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand here in the power of Christ we stand would you reach your hand to receive this 1 Peter 5, verses 10 to 11. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. See you soon.